1823, a human skeleton was found in one of the caves here on the Gower Peninsula in Wales. They seem to have been covered in a kind of red dye. They were accompanied by grave goods, by a necklace of, of seashells, mammoth ivory and a whole mammoth skull. Uh, and the best guess at the time was that these bones might have belonged to a Roman woman. They called her the Red Lady of Paviland. As it turned out, the bones were those of a man, and they weren't Roman. They were much, much older. According to the latest dating, they were 33,000 years old, making it the oldest ceremonial burial in Europe. The cave is only accessible at very low tides, and today there's a wind blowing in from the southwest. At the time of the burial, the cave was rather easier to reach than it is today. Yes, because uh, then the coast was about 70 miles away, and what's now sea was a great forested plain. That's, that's right. It's really the earliest definitive evidence we have of human beings reaching out beyond the horizon of death. What anthropologists call homo religiosus. These religious impulses seem to be part of our cognitive architecture. They are, if you like, in our bones, part of what we are as human beings. And they raise a profound question. We live today in a world that is dominated by science. But has science released us from our fundamental religious predisposition? Or has that religious predisposition motivated and inspired what today we call science? That is the question which these films set out to investigate. How do science and religion relate to one another? They express themselves in such different ways that it seemed to make sense for a scientist and an artist to try and investigate that question together. Our search for answers will take us on a journey across Europe, Asia and Africa, tracing the history of science from prehistory and ancient Greece through Islam and the Renaissance looking both at the connections and the disagreements. What about the conflicts between science and religion? We discover a kind of persistent relationship. You can think of it as being like a slipstream. When birds fly in a V formation, or Tour de France cyclists ride in a peloton, the movement of the air means that they don't have to work as hard as the one in front. They get a free ride in the slipstream. Human beings seem to reach out beyond the horizon of the visible world in order to try and make sense of it as a whole. You could describe it as ultimate curiosity. If then our curiosity about the world around us moves, as it were, in the slipstream of that ultimate curiosity, you could describe it as penultimate curiosity. I'm standing at the junction of two roads in the centre of Oxford. Down there are the spires and towers of the historic buildings at the heart of the university. To my right and behind me, the streets are lined with new laboratories. Laboratories are being built in universities all over the world. But it's easy to forget what a recent phenomenon this is. In 1860, a cousin of my grandfather, who was an undergraduate at the time, took a photograph from just about this spot. Here it is. 
It shows a, a new building that had just been put up. There's still scaffolding around the door. Now, in the 18th century, there had been an observatory that had built just down the road. But since then, this was pretty much the first purpose-built scientific construction that the university had ever commissioned. And if we walk a few yards down the road, we'll see that it's still there. When I was an undergraduate myself, about to leave the academic world and go off to art school, I became fascinated by this building. I was intrigued by the way it brought so many things together. As an artist, I've sometimes put new work in very old buildings. But I've also been interested in the collision between ancient stories and contemporary realities. This building, the Oxford University Museum, was full of such collisions. It was built in the style of a Rhenish medieval town hall, but constructed like a Victorian railway station in the latest materials of steel and glass. It was a building dedicated to the accuracies of science, but gave artists and craftsmen a free hand to indulge their fantasy and imagination. This museum had interested me for all kinds of artistic reasons. But when I came back to Oxford after art school and, and started work, I began to get interested in the scientific history of this place. And what had prompted that interest was getting to know a scientist. Today, Andrew Briggs is the first professor of nanomaterials at Oxford University. He investigates the strange world of quantum effects that lie at the roots of matter. When I first met him, he'd recently returned to science after taking a theology degree. For many years, my studio was on the top floor of the house in North Oxford, where the Briggs family lived. And several pictures, which are now in the Ashmolean Museum, were painted there. And during those years, we began a conversation about science that later turned into a book. For Andrew, as for me, a starting point had been an interest in a particular building. In my final year as an undergraduate at Oxford, I went for an interview in one of the most famous research institutes in the world, the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. It was an exciting moment, and as I walked through the entrance, I saw a Latin inscription that was carved into the doors. A hundred years earlier, uh, a Cambridge parish priest had gone to call on uh, a bedridden parishioner who was, as it happens, the man responsible for that inscription. The man was suffering from advanced stomach cancer and would in fact die a couple of days later. He'd had a bad night and the, uh, the priest who'd gone to bring communion didn't expect there to be any conversation. But as he robed himself to administer the sacrament, he heard a voice from the bed with a, a slight trace of a Galloway accent, reciting from memory all five verses of George Herbert's poem about the robing of Aaron. Holiness on the head, light and perfection on the breast, thus are true Aaron's dressed. Was that a slight Galloway accent? Well, I'm doing my best, Roger. <laughs> what the priest didn't know and didn't discover was that the man on the bed had changed the world. Fifteen years earlier, in what Richard Feynman described as the most significant event of the 19th century, he had written down four equations which not only describe a fundamental characteristic of the universe, but provide the basis for every electronic technology in the world today. What the priest did discover was that his parishioner seemed to know pretty well the entire Bible by heart, uh, and that the inscription over the doors of the laboratory had been inspired by a deep faith. And the relief over the entrance which shows an angel holding a book in one hand and three germ cells in the other, was intended to symbolize the unity between 
art and science and religion. The story of that sculpture and of the inscription at Cambridge inspired for both of us a 16-year intellectual journey. How, we asked each other, were the motivations of the religious invocations on the outside of those buildings related to the motivations of the scientific investigations that went on inside? In the book that Andrew and I wrote together, we traced these motivations as far back through history as we could go. And now we're going on a journey to explore some of the key places in the long and extraordinary story that we discovered. This is the uh, little plane we're going to be flying in. Yes, you can see the name on the side. Golf, Bravo Golf, Papa Lima. <laughs> it's quite small, isn't it? I can remember that in the 1990s, what people called the, the human revolution yeah. only happened, and so that was argued, when, when human beings migrated to Europe and started making paintings. And what changed that was the discovery in the Blombos Caves in South Africa of evidence that people were making symbolic markings 100,000 years ago. I mean, I, I, in the newspapers they described it as the, the first artist studio, which I love, because um, they found these extraordinary abalone shells which were used for storing and actually mixing pigment. Only last year in Indonesia they discovered evidence that when humans started to migrate from South Africa, one of the things they took with them was painting. And the first, what are pretty well the first European paintings were discovered just about the, the time we started writing this book. Or at least thinking about it, yes. Yeah, and that's where we're going now. In 1994, Jean-Marie Chauvet and two colleagues were exploring caves in the Ardèche Gorge when they came across a current of air, which they followed down into an enormous cave. In it, they found rock paintings that were not only the oldest that had ever been seen, but the most sophisticated. It was clear that enormous time and effort had gone into these images, but what had motivated this extraordinary enterprise? We can only guess at the beliefs of early human beings, but Jean Clotte, who led the subsequent excavations, is convinced that the motivation behind these paintings was religious. We know they have a religious motivation, uh, first because people didn't live inside those caves, and they went to those caves fully prepared with light and with uh, whatever was needed to make the paintings and the drawings. It was for some deep motive, which was not living in them or adorning a place which is in your immediate surroundings. When we look at what people did in other cultures, traditional cultures anywhere in the world, for which we have testimonies, for example, in Africa, in some parts of Africa, in some parts of, of, of the Americas, in India, etc. Rock art has always got what we call a religious motivation. As an artist, I was fascinated in the Chauvet cave by the, the anatomical accuracy of, the, of some of the images there. Do you think that was, could be any way related to this religious motivation? Doing it with such accuracy might have been vital because they were recreating them. So they, they were charged with power. Power, I think, about rock art is the main word and the main concept. It seems unlikely that prehistoric communities would devote resources to observing and studying the natural world simply for the sake of it. But could such observations be stimulated and carried along by the kind of motivation which led people to make these images deep underground? You could think of it as being like a slipstream. Why do geese fly in a V formation? Why do Tour de France riders stay within inches of the rider in front? The answer is that certain configurations not only reduce the wind resistance, but can actually create an energetic advantage from a vortex. 
Those behind don't have to work as hard as those in front. They get a free ride in the slipstream. Whatever the exact motivation of the people who made these paintings, we can be fairly sure that they didn't set out to investigate the anatomy of a horse. Yet with each successive image, the painter who drew these pictures corrected themselves through a possibly unconscious experimental process of trial and error. He or she produced a series that progressively becomes more anatomically correct until finally they end up with an image that Leonardo wouldn't be ashamed of. These four images of horses were found in perhaps the deepest part of the cave. They're all wonderfully vigorous, but whereas the, the first image is perhaps a little wobbly and generalised, by the time it comes to the, the third, the, the, the jaw and the, the great sternomastoid muscle of the neck is getting some real definition. By the fourth image though, things have moved on to a different level. You can see how the artist has, first of all, prepared the surface in much the same way I would do, uh, and then taken a piece of charcoal to produce his outlines, uh, and then taken what I'd call a stumping tool to, to work into that and to form the masses and shadows of the head, uh, and particularly the he's got the masseter muscles of, of the jaw. And whereas in the, the third image, the eye is still floating a little unconvincingly in the head, here it's firmly linked into the ridge of the, of the skull. To end with, he's taken a, a graving tool, perhaps a, a piece of bone, to create his, the highlights. First of all, they've sharpened the, the contours of the head. And then the artist has worked into the muzzle of the horse to create that wonderful flowering nostril. It was made perhaps 35,000 years ago and it's an astonishing piece of work. As far as we know that image didn't produce a whole new style of cave painting. The slipstream of religious motivation may not have been strong enough for that. But when agriculture came on the scene and settled societies developed with forms of writing, a whole series of organized religions began to appear all over the world, in China, in India, in the Middle East and in the Americas. And tucked in behind them are developments in astronomy, in medicine, in mathematics and chemistry, enjoying, as it were, a free ride in those more powerful slipstreams. So are there parallels to these kind of special configurations in the development of religions which have created equivalence to this kind of energetic advantage? We're on our way now to Western Turkey, to the ruins of Miletus. I mean, the ruins are somewhere inland, so I'm not sure well, we'll see them. In 600 BC, Miletus was a coastal town, a wonderful centre for new thinking where a new idea of the divine as the rational principle behind nature opened up a new kind of exploration of the natural world. This lion at one time stood at the entrance to a great harbour full of shipping. It was from here that the Apostle Paul said goodbye to the Ephesian elders. And it was to here in the sixth century before Christ that traders and travellers brought contact with cultures and religions from all over the Mediterranean world. This is the Buletarian of Miletus, the council chamber. That's a familiar concept to us. But in the 7th century BC, it was a, a new idea. In 806 BC, the first democracy had been established in Athens. And almost immediately, all over the Greek-speaking world, people began to passionately debate and argue about the nature of the best form of government. This theatre belongs to a later era, but the script you see on some of the seats, uh, here, Topos, Topos is the place, this was the place of some person, in others the place of the Jews. In the 6th century BC, 
The Greeks had recently adopted this script and it made an extraordinary difference. Previous Greek scripts had been quite complicated and been largely restricted to court officials for bureaucratic bookkeeping. But now you had the beginnings of a literate culture where people could write down and pass on their ideas and arguments. Put all these things together, the contact with other cultures, arguments about fundamental institutions, and the ability to write down these arguments and pass them on down the generations, and you get an explosive mixture, a mixture that disrupts traditional ideas of religion and leads to the emergence of a new idea of God. A poet called Xenophanes, who lived just up the coast from here, wrote that Ethiopians imagine their gods as black and snub-nosed, Thracians as blue-eyed and red-haired. The reality, he argued, was that God is one, greatest among gods and men, in no way like mortals, either in body or in mind. The idea began to develop that there might be a single divine principle, or arche, behind everything that we see. What was its nature? The first person to start speculating about this was called Thales. He said that everything was full of gods and suggested that the divine arche was water. His friend and pupil Anaximandros called it the boundless. Anaximandros had a pupil called Anaximenes who suggested that it was air. Across the water on the island of Samos, Pythagoras thought that number was the true divine principle. Just up the coast, a philosopher called Heraclitus argued that the ultimate rational principle behind the universe was an ever-living fire. However it was described, this new way of thinking about the divine as a rational principle behind everything had a profound influence on how people thought about the natural world. Instead of seeing earthquakes as Poseidon shaking the ground, lightning as Zeus throwing thunderbolts, or the sun as Helios driving his chariot, they began to ask how the divine rational principle could cause these things. In Miletus, Anaximandros was the first person to write a book about nature that set out physical theories to try and explain these things. It was the beginning of a whole new way of thinking in which Miletus might have led the world. But it didn't happen here. In 499 BC, Aristagoras, the tyrant of Miletus, incited the Greek-speaking cities of Ionia to stage a revolt against their Persian overlords. The rebellion, which lasted for six years, ended in disaster. Miletus, the glory of Ionia as Herodotus describes it, was, along with the other cities, razed to the ground and its inhabitants put to the sword. The Persians then began their preparations for the invasion of mainland Greece. The refugees who escaped to the mainland took their ideas with them, and one of those who did so was a young man called Anaxagoras. Well, crossing the Aegean to Athens, which is where Anaxagoras ended up, yes, it, it must have been for him a bit like a um, refugee from continental Europe coming over to England in 1939, yes. because almost as soon as he got here, he had to leave again. The, the Persians invaded and Athens had to be evacuated. Mm -hmm. Greeks, of course, won, famously won that battle, didn't they? And um, Anaxagoras went on to introduce some of these Miletan ideas to the Athenian citizens, and particularly the, um, that idea of the new concept of the, of the divine and the new, a new sort of interest in the physical world. Yes, his uh, idea of the divine principle was what he called mind. And uh, actually some of his ideas about the physical world were quite good too. Didn't Plato say he was the first person to, to work out how the, the shadowing of the moon was related to the sun? Yeah, and he also said that the sun was not a god, but a fiery ball. 
which in 4th century Athens must have been a pretty controversial thing to say. We get a clue to the extent of that controversy from a play called The Clouds, performed in this theatre. It's empty now, but in 423 BC, up to 14,000 people were crammed in here to watch a comedy about a local character called Socrates, who was ridiculed for performing absurd experiments, measuring how far a flea can jump, observing the orbit of the moon, and using geometry to make a map of the world. Most serious of all, replacing Zeus, the king of the gods, with vortex, a purely material concept. This was all good fun. And at the end of the play, when someone in the audience called out, who is this Socrates? The real Socrates is supposed to have stood up and silently bowed. But it wasn't such fun 20 years later when Socrates found himself on trial for the crime of corrupting the minds of the youth, introducing gods not known in the city, and was put to death. At his trial, he complained that the prosecutors uh, were accusing him of saying that the sun was a fiery lump and they must imagine they were prosecuting Anaxagoras whose, whose books were actually on sale here at the theatre. According to Plato, uh, who was a pupil of Socrates, he had actually been inspired by Anaxagoras' claim that mind produces order and is the cause of everything. And he found in that idea uh, a starting point for finding a basis for a rational morality that seemed to be undermined by some of these new ideas. But for some of his successors, it went beyond that. For them, it seemed also to provide a motivation for studying the natural world and looking for rational principles within it. The first person to take this idea forward was Plato, the pupil of Socrates. After his teacher's death, he left Athens and travelled in Italy, where he studied with the Pythagoreans, who believed that number was the divine principle at the heart of the universe. And when he came back to Athens, he set up a sort of philosophical school here in a grove of trees called Hecademos, or the Academy. It's said that he put a, an inscription over the doorway saying, let no one enter without geometry. So over to you, Andrew. <laughs> one person who did enter and even had a banquet given in his name was an astronomer and mathematician named Eudoxus. Eudoxus is supposed to have arrived as an impoverished student, sleeping in a boat down in Piraeus and walking up each day to lectures. Apparently Plato had set astronomers the following problem. By the assumption of what uniform and orderly motions can the apparent motions of the planets be accounted for? Eudoxus worked out that if you assume that the planets move in uniform circles around the Earth, then you can produce a reasonably accurate mathematical account. The scheme that Eudoxus worked out was wrong, though it took 2,000 years to discover that, but the idea of using mathematics to describe the way the world works was absolutely right and has been central to science ever since. The idea of a divine principle of reason ordering and giving coherence to the physical universe didn't just apply to the heavens and wasn't just a matter of geometry. It was the arrival of another foreigner in Athens who showed this. Aristotle, the son of a Macedonian doctor, became Plato's star pupil. Plato called him the mind of the school. And he worked here for 20 years. When Plato died, Aristotle left Athens and wandered among the Greek islands before becoming Alexander the Great's tutor. He returned to Athens after Alexander had defeated it and set up his own school here at the Lyceum. <laughs>
In one of his books, Aristotle tells the story of some visitors who came to see the philosopher Heraclitus. He didn't appear to be in, and they went into the house and found him warming his hands at the stove. They were a bit embarrassed, but Heraclitus said, come in, the gods are even here. In the same way, Aristotle says, we should approach the investigation of every kind of animal without being ashamed, since in every one of them is something natural and the serving of ends. It is the end, he argues, for the sake of which a thing has been constructed, which belongs to what is beautiful. For Aristotle, there was no principle more precious or divine than thinking about first principles and causes. Our ability to do so was the divinest part of us. Religious motivation thus led not only to astronomy, but to the study of every part of nature. Aristotle himself was a dedicated biologist. He refers to over 500 different species of animals and plants and carried out meticulous dissections. But he realized that studying nature, what we would call science, was a collective endeavor. And here, at the Lyceum, he set up what was in effect the world's first research institute. One colleague, Eudemus, produced a history of mathematics and geometry. Another called Mino produced a history of medicine. Theophrastus, who succeeded him, produced a history of physics, though he disagreed with Aristotle about the vacuum. A, a strength of Aristotle's school was that more than any other, it allowed people to disagree with the founder. <laughs> Up to a point, but I think that could be exaggerated. Unfortunately, this golden period didn't last long. Twelve years after Aristotle returned to Athens, Alexander unexpectedly died. Athens rebelled against Macedon, and Aristotle became a marked man. He might even have been prosecuted, but he didn't wait to find out. He went abroad and died shortly afterwards. None of the philosophical schools that followed in Athens had quite the same commitment to studying the physical world. Both the Stoics and the Epicureans emphasized what they called apathia, peace of mind. Epicurus and his followers were interested in using science as a way of calming religious anxieties and showing that we needn't worry about the gods. They were skeptical about really discovering anything. But Aristotle's model of a research institute wasn't forgotten. Alexander had exported Greek ideas all around the Mediterranean. He founded a whole succession of cities called Alexandria, and it's to the most famous of these that we're going next. So we're heading now pretty well directly towards Alexandria. Yeah, over there somewhere in the distance. I think it must have been a really remarkable city in the ancient world. Yes, yes. It was laid out by Alexander's architect, Dinocrates, who used a grid system. He installed underground drainage, and he divided it into five uh, zones. The Greeks lived in Alpha and Beta. Jews and other immigrants lived in Gamma and Delta. And then the native Egyptians lived in Epsilon. Epsilon yeah. It was a real cultural mix. And I think it must have been a very inter intellectually exciting place. Yes. Um, a, a, a Greek philosopher called Demetrius was exiled from Athens and made his way here. <laughs> same, same route as us, only a bit slower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he somehow persuaded um, Alexander's general Ptolemy to build a library and also a, a, a temple for the muses. Uh, thus the first museum, which was modelled on uh, Aristotle's Lyceum. Yeah. There's not much left today of classical Alexandria, whereas the harbour at Miletus is several miles inland, the museum and library of Alexandria are meant to be out there somewhere, under the harbour. In a way, they were something new. Public institutions that weren't identified with a particular philosophical school. The religious ideas articulated by Plato and Aristotle continued, though, to provide a powerful motivation for studying nature. <laughs> 
so that as late as the second century AD, the great Alexandrian astronomer Ptolemy said that astronomy makes those who follow it lovers of this divine beauty. While Galen, the famous doctor who studied here, said that true piety consists not in sacrificing, but in discovering and then showing to the rest of mankind God's wisdom, power and his goodness. In this powerful slipstream, Alexandrian science produced some remarkable results. In the third century BC, Aristophanes was the chief librarian at Alexandria. This is the contemporary successor of the library. And he successfully and accurately estimated the circumference of the earth. But what happened in this great multicultural city when the philosophical religion of the Greeks and the revealed religion of the Jews and Christians came into contact? Well, the answer was riots. In the first century AD, there were attacks on Jews and Jewish synagogues, while in the third century, it was reported that now Christians were daily being burned, confined or beheaded. However, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, some Christians behaved the same way towards pagans. The great pagan temple of Serapis was destroyed, and the philosopher Hypatia, who got caught up in the politics of the situation, was brutally murdered by monks. There was, however, a positive dimension to these encounters. One of the great projects the library sponsored was a translation of the Jewish scriptures known as the Septuagint. And as educated Greeks began to learn about Jewish thought, so educated Jews began to explore Greek philosophy and to see how their own traditions and scriptures might relate to it. Later on, a similar process was to happen among the Christians. In 2005, some new excavations in the centre of Alexandria uncovered something remarkable. It was here, in this place, Komeldika, which literally means heap of rubble. They revealed that this was the site of a school with some 20 lecture theatres. Although Christianity had been the official religion of the Roman Empire for 300 years, much of the administration and education was still run by people who worshipped the old gods. That meant that young Christian men who wanted an education would come to a pagan philosophical school like this one, where the curriculum was based not on Christianity, but on Neoplatonic philosophy. And sometime near the beginning of the 6th century AD, two new pupils arrived almost certainly at this school and began to attend the Friday afternoon seminars in the lecture theatres just down there. One of them was a pagan called Simplicius and the other was a Christian called John Philoponus. Professor Sir Richard Sarabji has spent a lifetime supervising the translation and publication of the works of these two men. So Simplicius was very committed to Aristotle's view of the world. And Aristotle had quite complicated ideas about how different kinds of motion worked. Aristotle uh, w was brilliant in his own way, but his theory of dynamics um, is wrong. He had different theories for different types of motion. Motion upwards and downwards of earth, air, fire and water was, was perfectly natural. But motion horizontally um, was enforced, not natural, as when you throw a javelin, mm. you force it to move. And he had different accounts of, of uh, what causes motion for these cases. And Philoponus rather challenged that. Now, Aristotle's theory uh, caused Philoponus a lot of laughs. Um, Aristotle's theory was that when you throw your javelin, you displace some air in front of the javelin, and the air's got nowhere to go because he didn't believe there was any vacuum. Mm. So what does the air do but, but come in behind the javelin, it's the only place left for it, and gives it an extra push. Mm. 
Well, he roared with laughter about that. He loved saying, even if you do something 10,000 times, nothing will happen. So he imagined that if Aristotle was right, all an army would have to do was to put its javelins on the top of a wall and then bring up 10,000 pairs of bellows and go whoosh. <laughs> and would the javelins go towards the enemy? No, they just drop down across the wall. And, and how did Philoponus challenge this view? Philoponus produced something that was called a scientific revolution by um, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, the only difficulty was that Thomas Kuhn and everybody in those days thought it was an invention of the 14th century. Right. Well, no, yeah. it was an invention of the 6th yeah. century by Philoponus. Right. Um, and the texts were preserved by the Arabs and then translated into Latin. That's how the 14th century knew it. They, this was invented by Philoponus. And he had an idea called impetus. The right story is <clears throat> that the thrower of the javelin implants an impetus or force inside the javelin and it's that force that keeps the javelin moving until that force expires. And he also used that to say it's absolutely absurd to say uh, that you couldn't have motion in a vacuum. Right. Another argument Aristotle had, and um, Galileo praised him for this in his early works on dynamics, mentioned it more often than he mentioned Plato. Aristotle thought that a vacuum can't exist. But Philoponus relied on observation. In one place he notes that in the snatchers used for drawing up wine, the void seems to exert a force. In the same place he notes that while Aristotle thought that a heavier substance falls faster than a light one, if you try it out, as Galileo was also to demonstrate a thousand years later, then Philoponus wrote, two unequal weights dropped from a given height strike the ground at almost the same time. As a Christian, Philoponus believed that the heavens were as much a part of God's creation as the earth. He pointed out that some of the characteristics of the heavens that had led Aristotle's followers to describe them as divine, such as their transparency and brilliance, were also properties of things like air, glass, water and fireflies. This annoyed Simplicius, who regarded Christianity as a religion for the uneducated. Philoponus was a... Novice, raven, jackdaw, who crows against the divine bird of Zeus. His works appeal to the uneducated, who always take pleasure in unusual things. How could anyone with a normal mind possibly conceive of such a strange god who hands over to nature the generation of the elements. It is an extraordinary way for a stupid person to inquire into truth. Simplicius and the pagan philosophers weren't the only people that Philoponus had to contend with. There were also literal-minded Christians like an Alexandrian monk called Cosmos Intercoplerstes, who talked of a, a very learned Christian, blinded by his craving for distinction, who, wishing to contend with the pagans, agrees with them that the heavens are a sphere always revolving, failing to acknowledge that it is the angels who move the stars and the luminaries. Indigo Plerstes suggested that the scriptures taught that the earth is flat and the heavens surround it like a box with a vaulted canopy. Philoponus argued that the purpose of scriptures was not to teach science, but to teach the knowledge of God. The fact of God's creation is revealed by the scriptures, but not how it came about. That meant we had to observe and had to find the simplest possible explanation. To Indigo Plerstes, he replies, the scriptures say nothing about angels moving the stars. Do they pull or push? While instead of Simplicius' complex Aristotelian notions of the different forces that move things, he proposes something more simple. Could not the sun, moon and stars be given, by God their creator, a certain kinetic force, in the same way that light and heavy objects are given their trend to move? <laughs> <laughs> 
After the Arab conquest of Egypt, Pelopinus' works were preserved and discussed by Muslim authors whose books first began to be translated into Latin in the 12th century. Pelopinus' own books appeared in Europe in the 16th century. The idea that God could order everything by simple laws had re-emerged in Christian writing in the Middle Ages. When this was combined with Plato's ideas about the divine beauty of geometry and mathematics, it gave birth to a new way of understanding the physical world. From the planetary laws identified by Johannes Kepler to the laws of motion formulated by Isaac Newton, great thinkers began to discover that the whole physical universe could be described mathematically. And nowhere was that more clearly seen than in the equation showing the unity between electricity, magnetism, and light. These were the equations that were written out by the parishioner visited by the clergyman in Cambridge, James Clark Maxwell. These men all saw their scientific work as part of their religious life. And that wasn't simply fanciful. The assumption that the physical universe can be rationally understood is a basic premise of science, but it isn't something that's easy to philosophically justify. Karl Popper, a 20th century philosopher of science, once wrote that it requires a faith which is completely unwarranted from the point of view of science and which is, to that extent, metaphysical. That faith didn't arise out of any one religious belief but seems to have developed out of a kind of dialogue between them and is part of a larger human need that we find evidence for in the earliest traces of humanity, a need to try to make sense of the world as a whole by reaching out beyond the horizon of what we can see. In a lecture in the Oxford University Museum to some of my colleagues, we tried to describe how this slipstream of religious motivation continued after Alexandria had fallen to the Muslim armies. With the coming of Islam, Muslim scholars emphasized that Allah, who creates everything, is the source of all truth, so that truth must be sought for and embraced in whatever culture it can be found. In the slipstream of that idea, a massive translation movement has begun in the 10th century. The House of Wisdom is established in Baghdad, and astronomical observatories are built throughout the Muslim world. Outside the Muslim world, these ideas are picked up in the West in the 12th century and developed in the new Christian universities, where following up the idea of a divine lawgiver, scholars and theologians begin to search for mathematical laws underlying physical phenomena and to use what they begin to call experimental science to study the world. When new technologies come online, when telescopes and microscopes begin to open up the depth of the universe and the world of the small, and printing enables the rapid transfer of information, the speed increases. When Luther and others set out to democratize the reading of God's word, Later Reformation thinkers like Francis Bacon apply this to the reading of God's works, suggesting it needs to be a joint enterprise in which all conditions of people have a part. And now we're piling on speed. In Oxford and elsewhere in the 17th century, groups of experimenters, astronomers and mathematicians begin to come together and collaborate. The Royal Society is founded and its transactions are published. Isaac Newton, in his Principia Mathematica, describes a law-like universe. The most beautiful system of the sun and the planets which could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. And suddenly we're flying. Laws of nature are looked for everywhere. How much more simple and sublime, says Darwin, if God says, let animals be created by fixed laws of generation. Universities begin to put Andrew, up buildings like... Andrew, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, Excuse me. but it's not very comfortable. What about the conflicts between science and religion? Ah, Colin, that's a good question. So, for those who didn't hear, Professor Blakemore is asking what about the conflicts between science and religion. 
I think actually we, we could address that um, by thinking of, um, of what happens in a, a slipstream and uh, going back to that idea of, uh, of the Tour de France and uh, what happens there when things uh, sort of begin to go wrong. Well, it works like this. The, the drag on the lead cyclist increases with speed and to maximize the benefit the, the one behind must uh, cycle as close as possible, sometimes actually within centimetres of the leader. When wheels clash, uh, it's obviously a disaster, everyone falls down, you get the, the shoot, the, um, the, the pile-ups that are very much a, a characteristic uh, of that race. Yes, and, and so I suppose when um, science really starts travelling in the slipstream of religion, the temptation to close the gap, to, to try to make um, science answer religious questions and vice versa can become very strong and the clash of ideas that results can produce a, a kind of a pile up a sort of a shoot in which everyone falls over so when a canon at Frombork cathedral called nicholas copernicus produces a model with the sun at its center and a catholic layman called galileo galilei produces an argument they're not observational proof that that Copernicus is right, religious authority is used to stifle dissent. Alternative explanations are suppressed. Wrong explanations are set in stone. And they're down again. This shoot is perhaps the most famous in the history of science. And as our journey continues, we're on our way to see the place where it all began. Well, I see that we the, um we leave rather a greater margin for error when we're flying than, than they do in the Tour de France. Absolutely. Uh, in, a, in a peloton, they may leave margins of a centimetre or less. Yeah. When we're flying, we like to have very much more than that. And this route from Pescara to Pisa, we pass mountains of 8,000 feet. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so we're now at 9,000. Well, that's, that's reassuring to say. In fact, when you get up close to them, these shoots we've been describing always turn out to be more complicated, don't they, than when they, they might first appear. Yeah, they, they, what we seem to have in common is that they tend to occur when there's a great acceleration of thinking and ideas. Yeah, so that, I mean, when printing was first invented, all kinds of knowledge and thoughts and, and concepts were suddenly available to anyone who could read. And around about the same time, the fall of Byzantium led to a flood of Greek-speaking scholars into Europe. And once again, it was rather like the, the sudden influx of um, scientists and scholars from continental from Europe to, to Britain at the beginning of the Second World War. I think that's right. Um, the place where the Greek-speaking scholars had the greatest impact was where we are going to now. Which, which is Pisa, the city of the Leaning Tower. On a Thursday morning in 1615, a Benedictine monk was leaving this building across the river, the Medici Palace in Pisa, when the doorman called him back. The monk, Father Castelli, had been attending a breakfast with the Grand Duchess Christina. He had been describing to her his observations through a telescope the night before of the moons of Jupiter and his teacher's theory of the motion of the planets. Throughout breakfast, a philosopher from Pisa University, Dr. Bascaia, had been whispering in the ear of the Grand Duchess that what the monk was saying couldn't be true because it contradicted Holy Scripture. Now Father Castelli was summoned back to play the theologian, as he put it, and explain why this was not the case. There was no contradiction. Although he quoted from the scriptures, in fact, many of Dr. Boscalia's objections and those of other philosophers here at the University of Pisa were based on the views of Aristotle. Aristotle had said that the heavens and the earth were made of different substances and moved in different kinds of ways. But was that true? At the same time that the refugee scholars were coming from Byzantium, a whole flood of ancient Greek manuscripts were beginning to be translated and set in print for the first time. 
and among these were those of the Alexandrian Christian, John Philoponus. Now, not everyone appreciated them. There was one famous philosopher at the university here um, who accused the Alexandrian philosophers of wishing to be seen as Christians when they deal with Aristotle, with the result that they have fallen simultaneously into being pseudo-philosophers and pseudo-Christians. Bonamici, though, had a star pupil who took a very different view. This was the man who went on to become the teacher of Father Castelli, and his name was Galileo Galilei. In his notes written while he was a professor here in Pisa, Galileo describes Philoponus as a man forced by the power of truth to recognize the falsity of Aristotle's views. In those same notes, he describes carrying out a periculum, meaning a test or experiment, in which he dropped unequally weighted objects from a high place. His student said it was the Leaning Tower, and observed, as Philoponus had a thousand years earlier, that they struck the ground at approximately the same time. A few years later, Galileo moved from his post here at Pisa to the University of Padua and came across a brand new optical invention, later known as a telescope. Galileo made his own modifications and almost immediately began looking at the moon and the stars. And what he saw confirmed everything that Philoponus had said. The heavens seemed to be made of exactly the same kind of stuff as the earth. The moon had mountains and valleys, like he said, an area of Bohemia. Jupiter had moons, like the Earth has a moon. When Galileo published these results in a little book called Siderius Nuncius, The Starry Message, he became instantly famous. These discoveries fitted very well with a theory that had been put forward by a Polish churchman called Nicholas Copernicus. This suggested that the Earth rotated round the Sun and not the other way round. The theory was at first well received, but had fallen under suspicion. Galileo was very anxious that the church shouldn't make the mistake of condemning it. As far as we know, he was a fairly conventional and committed Catholic with a uh, normal set of Catholic beliefs and Catholic practices. Uh, his daughter was uh, in a convent, and Galileo himself in 1632 actually became a member of one of the clerical orders. And I think we should understand that the Catholic Church had been a long time supporter of astronomy. In fact, one historian has estimated that from the 12th century to the 18th century, no institution uh, gave more support to the study of astronomy than the Catholic Church. What was exceptional about this case that made the Church intervene in a way that it normally wouldn't? I think there are two things, really. The Protestant Reformation had made significant inroads into Europe, and the Catholic Church was very concerned about the waning of its authority and power. And one of the distinctive things about Protestantism was claiming the right to interpret the Bible for themselves. Now, Galileo, in a, in a famous letter, um, made some remarks about how uh, particular interpretations of scripture would support his view of the cosmos, that is to say, the Copernican view of the cosmos. Now, the church regarded this then as not so much a scientific matter, but a scientific matter that had religious implications, and that this was the point at which they thought that they needed to take some action, because Galileo seemed to be adopting a position uh, that had theological implications. Uh, he claimed to be interpreting the Bible, and in a context where this was what the Protestants were doing, uh, the Catholics were concerned to intervene. Like Philoponus, he argued that the purpose of the scriptures was to teach the knowledge of God, not to teach science. How to go to heaven, not how heaven goes. When the new Pope gave him permission to publish a book on the subject, he did it in the form of a dialogue. In this dialogue, all the old-fashioned Aristotelian arguments are put in the mouth of Philoponus's pagan opponent, the philosopher Simplicius. Unfortunately, among the arguments he put into Simplicius's mouth 
was one put forward by the Pope himself, that no mathematical model could give a definitive answer to physical questions, which was true. The Pope was furious and Galileo was forced to recant. I was just leaving Italian airspace and I suppose um, that's sort of what happened to Galileo's last book. Yes, the next book, in which, in which actually Simplicius again appears, was smuggled out to Holland to be printed by a Protestant. Yeah, that's true, but it, it doesn't mean that, um, that Galileo himself had Protestant sympathies. No, to, towards the end of his life he, he wore a tonsure and he uh, said the daily office. Yeah. But in that book where he outlines a, a concept of momentum which would apply both to comets and to cannonballs, he identifies a sense of the underlying lawfulness in the universe which seems to him to have a religious significance. Yes, and in the book it's actually Simplicius who says that there must be some great mystery hidden in these wonderful results. Um, he describes it as a, a mystery related to the creation of the universe and the seat of the great cause. Uh, yes, <laughs> when that idea was developed by Newton, it gave rise to a whole new set of different kinds of shoots and crashes. Yeah, I suppose it did really, yes. Galileo's idea of the fundamental lawfulness of the universe was echoed by his great Protestant contemporary, Johannes Kepler, who described his own work as thinking God's thoughts after him. He worked out that the planets don't travel in circles, as the Greeks had thought, but in ellipses. He described three laws of planetary motion that led directly to one of the great triumphs of science, Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica. This was a triumph, however, that was soon to lead to another kind of shoot. A century later, Newton's Principia is taken by materialists as a proof of materialism and by theists as a proof for natural theology. The weaponization of science in the battle for intellectual credibility produces a stalemate which is followed by the beginning of a romantic repudiation of science. And it's a shoot. And Adam. And now we're in the 19th century, and attempts to prove God does or doesn't exist move from physics to biology. William Paley's natural theology finds evidence for God in everything from the hinge of a bivalve to the epiglottis of an alderman. Why an alderman? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, and <laughs> Darwin's theory of evolution, of course, is used by secularists to discredit the book of Genesis. <laughs> and they're down, it's a shoot, it's a massive pile-up. According to the instructions, race marshals should try to prevent falls in the first place by blowing whistles and waving flags to warn of tricky conditions. When falls happen, in most cases, the cyclists get back on their bikes. The marshal's job is then to move aside bicycles that are obstructing the route. So are there people in history who have acted, as it were, like race marshals, warning of tricky conditions uh, and clearing away obstructions? Let's run the story one final time, focusing not on slipstreams or shoots, but on a few of the people who've taken on this marshalling role, warning against hazards in the relationship between science and religion, and showing how these two different forms of curiosity may most fruitfully work together. And somewhere near the beginning of the route, our first race marshal is John Philoponus, the Christian philosopher. His slogan was, let nothing in any manner get in the way of truth. 300 years down the track, as it winds through 9th century Baghdad, is our next marshal, Abu Yasuf Yaqub al-Kindi a man described as the philosopher of the Arabs. Who promoted the adoption of Indian numerals by the Arabs and wrote that we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or acquire it from wherever it may be found, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign peoples. All are ennobled by it. Another 400 years on, as the route comes now through 13th century Oxford, is Robert Grosseteste, in effect the first chancellor of the university before becoming Bishop of Lincoln. He translated Aristotle and wrote one of the first Latin commentaries on his works. 
Grosseteste argued that Christians shouldn't pointlessly try to make a Christian out of Aristotle, but should learn from his method of arriving at the truth. He was one of the first people to outline the methodology of what we would describe as a controlled experiment. He went on to do pioneering work on the geometry of light that inspired Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon was a Franciscan friar in Oxford whose writings promoted experimental observation and the critical importance of mathematics. As with Robert Grosseteste, this idea came out of his conviction that God was the source of all order. It's extraordinary how his successors in the medieval Oxford colleges took over this conviction, the, the conviction that there were universal laws of nature that could be mathematically defined. And, and they even found a result that was later used by Galileo. And 400 years later, it was uh, another Bacon, Sir, Sir Francis Bacon. Sir Francis. Yeah, same, same name, different person. Yeah. Who argued that universities like Oxford should resemble mines, where the, um, the noise of new works and further advances is heard on every side. And in the middle of the 17th century, of course, that actually began to happen. All of which means, I suppose, it's time to head back to Oxford. Back we go. Moving on another 400 years as we come past Wadham College, here is Warden John Wilkins, later Bishop of Chester, who eight years after the condemnation of Galileo brought out a book in which Copernicus, Galileo, uh, with Kepler peering over his shoulder, appear as the heroes of his title page. Wilkins became the warden here at Wadham just after the Civil War, and it was his ambition to make the university into the sort of place that Francis Bacon had imagined. This was a book that Wilkins published as a young man. He was 24 when he first published it. It was called A Discourse on a World in the Moon, A New World. What we have here, of course, is Galileo with his telescope, Kepler. And there's Kepler peeping there he behind is, him. And yes. my Kepler greatly <laughs> peeping over his shoulder. And there's Copernicus, who lived a hundred years earlier, with the little model of his universe. There's the sun and the planet going around him, you see. But up here is the important part. Here's the sun. He's a source of light, motion, and heat. In other words, he warms, he illuminates, he spins and he turns the planets in their courses. Of course, he didn't know any planets in those days beyond Saturn, but notice the stars. And unlike all earlier writers, such as Copernicus and even Galileo, he didn't speak of there being a sphere of stars, a singular sphere, the eighth sphere, as it was called. Here the stars are scattered through the universe, suggesting an infinite universe. And when Wilkins became warden here at Wadham, he started an experimental club. He did indeed. And it was the first great club of this kind in European science. And what was life like in it? It was a very jolly group. And the Honourable Robert Boyer, an Irish peer, an Irish peer's son, founded a laboratory, a private one, just a quarter of a mile from where we are now. And, and here we've got and a book here we by have Boyle. Boyle's work. Now, I love this, this table here because these are his experimental data from the experiment that he did where he had a, um, a J-tube. Absolutely. To investigate what he discovered as the springiness of air. And why this was so intellectually shocking, it contradicted 2,000 years of science. Moving away from the notion that air is some sort of fixed element Absolutely. towards the notion that air is some material stuff whose properties you can investigate experimentally. Uh, uh, physically, measurably, and this is so central to the early science. It wasn't just, I have a pet theory, I have a concept, it was measure it, observe it. And that's what I love about this, because you have the columns here, and because in the last column here, having given all his experimental measurements, column E is what the pressure should be according to the hypothesis that supposes the pressures and expansions to be in reciprocal proportion, what we now call Boyle's law. Absolutely. And the two columns don't agree. Yes. There was no cheating. Yes. And now he discusses something which, which every scientist nowadays learns as part of their apprenticeship, yep. but here he is formulating it, is what do we do about this discrepancy between 
measurement and hypothesis. And he realises that, but of course the central thing, as you say, Andrew, is the necessity of having complete accuracy. And the fact that it's public. You publish it in a book. As this um, precision in experimental science grew, what did this group in Wadham contribute to seeing that kind of curiosity uh, in the context of the bigger picture of ultimate questions? They saw it as profoundly revelatory. It's impossible to think of these men or of these culture in a secular context. Their Christian faith, not just their religion, their Christian faith, and their science went like that. They were asking how wonderful that God has made a universe so exact and has given us the brains to fathom it out. In another book, The Christian Virtuoso, Robert Boyle argues that by being addicted to experimental philosophy, a man is rather assisted than indisposed to be a good Christian. And that brings us directly to the idea embodied in the Oxford University Museum, where Coming into the final straight is Henry Ackland, doctor and Regis Professor of Medicine, who was the friend of art critic John Ruskin, studied with the painter Samuel Palmer, uh, and is, for that reason, my personal hero. So this is the doorway, which in my cousin's photograph is covered with all that scaffolding. And there's a story behind that, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, because um, Ruskin and Ackland both thought of this building as something that would unite science and art and religion, um, which for Ackland was, was sort of symbolised the purpose of the museum. It, it seems that for Ackland, his faith underpinned everything he did. I think that's right. Ackland championed scientific medicine. He became a passionate advocate of public health and led the movement for developing science within the university. He won theologians to the cause of science and campaigned to award Darwin an honorary degree. He saw religion, science and art as complementary endeavours and brought them together in this museum that he campaigned for here in Parks Road. If you seek his monument, Look around you. Ruskin was so committed to, uh, to this project that he even built, or said to have built, one of the pillars of, of these, piers of these pillars with his own hand. Is that the one that had to be dismantled and rebuilt by a professional bricklayer? Yes. <laughs> I make no comment on the artistic temperament. <laughs> Very commendable. <laughs> Finally, travelling to Cambridge, we arrive back where we started with the patient on the bed, who many of you will have recognised as James Clark Maxwell. As a student, I went for an interview in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Walking through the entrance, I saw a Latin inscription carved into the doors. That inscription, a quotation from Psalm 111, had been placed there by James Clark Maxwell, who had designed the laboratory following his appointment as the first Cavendish professor. Maxwell's career ended in Cambridge, but it had not begun there. Maxwell grew up here in Glenlair House, which was designed by his father. His father also designed his school clothes. When he turned up wearing them, he became known as Dafty Maxwell. I don't suppose the name stuck because he went on to become a child prodigy. At the age of 14, he wrote a paper which was read at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. A few years later, in a small laboratory over the wash house here, he devised a method of visualizing elastic stress distributions which continued to be used by engineers for over a century. He developed a mathematical account of the rings of Saturn. He devised a theory of color. In fact, he took the first ever color photograph. I could go on talking about his discoveries, but there was one discovery he made 
which has changed the modern world in which we now live. The Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman has described it as the greatest event of the 19th century. And this began with a discovery in Copenhagen. Yes, a Danish scientist called Ørsted in 1820, according to some accounts actually while he was giving a uh, lecture, was passing a current through a wire and noticed that a nearby compass needle deflected. And we can show it here, because if we, uh, uh, there's the wire, there's the compass, and we oh, turn yes. the switch yes. and it deflects. But Faraday then took this, this whole idea further. Yes, Faraday took uh, this discovery of Ørsted's, uh, made the, the, the first electric motor, and then he showed that you could turn the whole thing the other way around, and if you uh, take a magnet and move it near a wire, then you can induce a current. So what he did, here's a coil, and you can see it on the meter there. As I put the magnet into the coil, the needle deflects, and as I yes, take it out, yes, the needle yes, deflects yes, again. Yes. And, and Faraday had a, had a theory, or developed a theory, about how this worked. Yes, he introduced the concept of a field uh, in the space surrounding the magnet or the wire. And uh, one used to be able to show this with a, uh, a magnet and a piece of paper and sprinkle iron filings out yes, of a I pepper remember that from school. That was all fun. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a slightly uh, more modern version of it. Do you see all these teensy little compass needles? And as I bring the compass up to there, you can see oh, yes, that the patterns. needles yes, make the patterns yes. of this uh, field around the magnet. The question then was, how are electricity and magnetism related? Glenlair is a house surrounded by water. And when Maxwell first began to mathematically develop the ideas of Faraday about electricity and magnetism, he started with equations derived from fluid dynamics. He moved on from that to more mechanical models of, of cogs and idle wheels. When the, the cog turns in one direction, the idle wheel goes in another. But in the end, he came back to water. The question he asked himself was, were these forces static, like a concrete floor, or were they elastic, like the, the surface of a pond or a, or a river? And the answer he knew from experiment was that they were elastic. Now, all uh, elastic media transmit waves, and that meant that wherever there was a change in the electric or magnetic field, there would be ripples spreading out. The whole universe would be filled with the surge of electromagnetic waves. And this led to a remarkable possibility. It was here, in this house in Glenlair, that Maxwell, on his summer holiday, calculated the speed of the electromagnetic waves. He, he wondered if that might be the same as the speed of light. When he put those quantities into his calculations, he found that indeed the speed of the electromagnetic waves is the same as the speed of light. He wrote, it's hard to avoid the inference that light consists of undulations in the same medium that is responsible for electric and magnetic phenomenon. He had shown that electromagnetic waves and light are the same thing. The question was how to get at that theory. The clergyman who called on Maxwell just before he died described how Maxwell had gauged and fathomed all the schemes and systems of philosophy and found them utterly unworkable. He went on to describe Maxwell's simple faith in the gospel of the Saviour. In a similar way with his science, what mattered for Maxwell was whether something worked, even if you didn't completely understand how. He used the analogy of bell ringers pulling ropes that go up through a hole in the ceiling. As long as we can securely link the pulling of the rope to the sound of the bell, we don't need to know what's actually going on in the belfry. We can have a workable knowledge of reality without necessarily knowing how it works. <laughs>
and it was the same here. Maxwell's equations leapfrog over physical models of water or cogs, and simply describe in beautiful mathematics the relationship of electricity, magnetism, and light. Their description of the fundamental gearing between space and time led directly to Einstein's theories, but they also provide the basis for all the electronic technologies that shape the modern world. The world we live in today begins with these equations. But Maxwell himself didn't live to see it. When he died at the age of 48, not even the greatest of his contemporaries had understood what he had done. So that whereas Newton and Darwin were buried in Westminster Abbey with great ceremony, Maxwell is buried here in the old kirk in Parton Churchyard. Not that I think that would have worried him at all. As a graduate student, I suggested that Maxwell's quotation should be placed over the new Cavendish entrance, and now in English. Somewhat to the surprise of the head of department, the policy committee enthusiastically agreed to this. It reads, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. While Maxwell thought that Christians whose minds were scientific should approach their work in this spirit, he was equally clear that because science is always changing, it's a mistake to look for a static harmony between science and religion. Don't confuse penultimate curiosity with the ultimate kind. Move in the slipstream, but don't let the wheels touch. As a young man, Maxwell wrote a reflection expressing the aspiration that his working life should, as far as possible, be integrated with his ethical and spiritual identity. Happy is the man who can see in the work of today a connected portion of the work of life and an embodiment of the work of eternity. Didn't um, Max Planck once say that um, anyone who has ever done any serious scientific work knows that over the doors of the Temple of Science are written the words, ye must have faith. It's a good motto for a scientist. And for an artist. <laughs> and perhaps for everyone. <laughs>